Continue. Alrighty. Okay, we're recording. Andrew, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you this morning? Not too bad. Not too bad. I mean, this is a, an audio, so people haven't uh, can't see what I can see. You are literally in a wardrobe. I am. <laughs> it's the only uh, quiet place I can go sometimes. So uh, I'll uh, take it where I can. Yeah. Um, aside from the wardrobe, um, whereabouts are you uh, generally? Uh, at home in uh, Chapel Hill, North Carolina. So right in the middle of the state. So what's the, 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 the situation um, like? I should say we're recording this on the, the, the 15th of July. This is in the week that the UK have announced that um, as of next week, um, all restrictions are dropped. So uh, just wondering what, what the, absolutely, like what, what the situation is like where you are, mate. Um, it's a little bit of that and also still, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of distancing going on and, uh, people still trying to kind of work their way back out in the world. It's a little, it's odd, you know? Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, I mean, you go some places in the, in the States and no one's wearing masks and everybody's just going about their daily life like they did yeah. pre pandemic. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It, it feels good to be getting back to normal a little bit, but also, uh, yeah, trying to not be uh, completely fearful for your life and for your family's safety when you go out to just buy some milk, you know. Absolutely. So, yeah. Absolutely. And, and and just to, you know, the, the last kind of uh, thing really on, on, on the situation that we've all been thrust into, um, them, them last 14, 15 months, how have you found that personally? as well as creatively um personally it's been kind of kind of a wild time you know i mean I, i've always had travel to distract me from myself uh so i feel like i've gotten to know myself pretty well the past 15 months or 16 months however long it's been um and i think through that creatively actually i've had little spurts of creativity but for the most part i've been uh spending more time just staring out windows you know and doing that whole thing um but i think you know i think one thing i keep trying to do is remind myself that uh that this it wasn't this whole pandemic wasn't about me you know it's uh we've lost a lot of people in the world and i think as exciting as it is to get to hop on stage again these past few months and to get to travel um it's it's really it's really grounding and humbling to remember how many people have suffered through this thing, you know, and how many people have lost loved ones. Um, Absolutely. Um, and I'm one of the fortunate ones that didn't, didn't lose too many people to COVID, you know, and yeah. also um, got to hang out with my wife and daughter the whole time, you know, so yeah. Um, all in all, can't complain, you know? Okay. Yeah. Well, well let, let's let's talk about something that always, uh, I'm sure, um, puts a smile on, on, on your face, and that's records. Um, yeah. And I'm going to ask you, um, please, Andy, for track one, to tell me the song that you think has the greatest ever intro. Um, I would say uh, one by Metallica has the greatest intro, um, and one of the most deceiving ones because it. It starts out so beautiful and uh, Kirk Hammett's play and it's just so melodic and uh, toneful. And then, um, you know, they kind of lay the bed for this um, wonderful story throughout the whole song. And it just gets progressively more and more heavy um, until you're just banging your head away, you know. Um, yeah. I love that transition, you know, and the, and the way they they just take you through all of these different, um, different feelings and different moods. Um, and I, I, some of those earlier Metallica records just do that so wonderfully. So. So, I mean, a lot of people, you know, when, when they talk about Metallica, you know, they, they reference that track and rightly so. It's, uh, you know, it's an absolute monster of a record. Um, and I, I think now, if we, you know, Metallica being one of the, the, the biggest bands on the planet, uh, I find it really interesting in regards to intros and song length, I think, what's one, maybe seven, eight minutes, something like that, isn't it? So it's, yeah, it's, it is. It's a long old tune. And I just wonder now, like with, you know, major labels, would they sort of step on that a little bit now and go, right, hang on, no, we need a three minute radio edit of this. And and I, I just wonder the way that 
the industry appears to be and, and the way that um, attention spans of lots of, well, I'm, I'm talking about my daughters that whose thumbs move very fast nowadays. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I just wonder if any of these sort of things that are changing in the in the way that people listen to music have any effect on on you when you sit down to write a song. Um, I try to stay out of that whole mentality. You know, I I when I sit down to write, I try to figure out how I feel and that how everybody else feels you know and yeah. then hopefully that translates and somebody else can latch on to those feelings and make them relevant yeah. for their self um but um but it does seem like you know everything's getting a little more streamlined and uh you just want to get ideas across as soon as possible and like kind of almost hit people over the head with a melodic idea you know um but you know there's a lot of bands out there that are doing wonderfully subtle stuff um yeah and making making beautiful records that I think once um you know uh society realizes that their attention span is dwindling and we kind of somehow or another probably create an app to uh which is already created to improve our uh <laughs> attention spans. Um I think there's a lot of wonderful music being made right now yeah. for people that can actually pay attention. So that's one of the great things I think about podcasts. I think that podcasts aren't getting shorter. If anything, you know, some podcasts go on for like you know two, three hours. And I do think that's an opportunity where you're not skipping to the next track. You know, you're not, your attention span isn't really, you know, th th there's nothing else to go to. If you, you know, if you've got an engaging conversation, then, you know, like a, you know, like a what's going on or something like that, you've got that kind of, that body of work, that piece of art to get lost in, and you're not trying to get that quick fix. Do you know what I mean? And I hope that major labels and pop records do slow down a little bit because I, I, I'd hate to think that commercial pop records were are going to end up being like, you know, 50 seconds long, and, you know, released yeah. only on TikTok and things like that. That that terrifies me. That, that I think, you know, I worry enough about the fact that you know, in regards to lots of, sort of big commercial artists, their their records are not necessarily album sales. People are just cherry picking tracks, and that that worries me. That you know, records or albums aren't being listened to as a body of work. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think one thing with podcasts too is that a lot of times they're live, and so you get um, this sense of immediacy and a like just in the moment feel that. Um, you know, I think like 30, 40 years ago, you would have, you get a lot of that from pop music because the, just the way in which people recorded, they didn't have the options to nitpick and to yeah. make things perfect. There was, you're actually hearing a performance, um, you know, where some of those solos were just done live, you know, just off the cuff, um, yeah. which to me, like, just conjures up all sorts of natural scenes, you know what I mean? Like, um, nature is inherently not perfect and it's a little asymmetrical and it's um but it's really beautiful in that asymmetry and that non-perfectness you know and so um that's one of the things that i hope music doesn't lose is you know it's just this sense of wildness um and just you know imperfectness you know so i'm gonna take you back for track two and I'm going to ask you to tell me the first song you remember hearing that had an emotional impact on you, please. Oh, yeah. Um, that, uh, yeah, it was fun, like, reading these questions beforehand, just, like, thinking about these things. Um, but I remember when, I guess I had, I was probably, like, 16, my, a good friend of mine had just got subwoofers in his car. And uh, and so he was like, come on, man, I got to I gotta show you this record, you know? So here I am thinking he's going to put on some, hip-hop track you know and uh and we were just gonna just dance away like crazy which would have been fun and we did afterwards probably but um but we sat in the car and he put on the magical mystery tour by the beatles and if you've never listened to the magical mystery tour with uh like really good speakers you know with a lot of low end and uh the whole record is super powerful and there's so many textures and there's so many um just wonderful elements to every song but strawberry fields when that came on it was like dude this is out I, I want this you know what i mean like i i need this in my life all the time um yeah. 
And I think that was really when just the whole idea of making a record and making a recording just made its way into my heart. And it was like, yeah. this is what, this is what I want to do. I want to, I want to figure out how to like put these tones together. I want to figure out how to put these, just all of these different elements, um, you know, together and make one beautiful stereo track. Like that's, that's my dream, you know, and I have not come close to uh, achieving strawberry fields. But, uh, <laughs> There's a lot of people out there striving for that, brother. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, but that, yeah, I mean, but that that one song, it's like you could listen to it a thousand times, and I have, and still hear new things about it, and I love that. I love, and it's yeah. so subtle, you know. I mean, like the the raw elements of that tune are super simple and very catchy, but then it's the underbelly that like yeah. keeps you coming back and trying to figure it out. So, so e even at quite a sort of, you know, formative age, when you was listening to music, would you start to sort of try and deconstruct it and work out the different elements and how it was, you know, layered and put together? I would, yeah, I just put on headphones and I feel like, uh, I've, the way I think about the stereo field now is I'll close my eyes and I'll just try to look at the thing that I'm listening to in the stereo field. Yeah. So you can actually like, it gets to a point where you can kind of just point to little things, you know, and, and it's fun to put on headphones and literally explore this whole uh, just world between your left and right ears. <laughs> uh, I, there's just, there's so much happening there. And, and if you get to the point where you can close your eyes and start pointing at things, it almost is like going on a little journey, you know, for about three minutes or however long the track is. So. Okay, well, I'm going to keep you in the formative years. And right. <laughs> for, for track three, uh, I'm going to ask you for the song that reminds you of your time at school, please. Um, yeah, that one, I went with uh, Looks Just Like the Sun by Broken Social Scene. Um, I, I got turned on to that record actually right after I graduated high school, but it was still, you know, very much in that high school mentality where I was hanging out with all my school buddies and we were just, you know, going camping on the lake or, or, just always hanging together and basically never sleeping and partying way too hard. Uh, but it was so much fun. You know, there was no, not a whole lot of uh, responsibility there, especially for that first summer after we graduated. And I remember hearing that record that summer and just being completely awed by it. It was, you know, what a, what a magical record that is. And I Incredible think, record. yeah, I think, um, well, it's like a it's like a conglomerate, right? It's like it's a lot of artists coming together together to make this record. Um, I feel like you can hear that. There's so much creative energy on that, and so much excitement, and it feels it feels like a hang. You know, it's like when you put that record on, it feels like you're at a party. It's like a little sonic party. But uh, but looks like the sun. Uh, looks just like the sun. That that song in particular, it's just so it's so chill you know and it's it's very acoustic which uh which i um really gravitate towards in general just those tones um but there there's a lot achieved there with very few lyrics and very few moves it's a pretty pretty basic track in terms of um the structure of it and i just yeah i just love the way that sounds and i bet i listened to that song five thousand times that summer so yeah yeah how was um how was school as an experience uh school was something that i just had to get through you know um i always like um, for some reason you know class was never very difficult for me i could kind of like get by without studying much um but i would just sit there and like write songs during class you know on, on, little piece of notebook paper or like write down ideas that, of things that I would have and I basically like my days were like just full of little things that I had to do in order to get to the point where I could finally get home and pick up a guitar um, yeah. and I wasn't that present for a lot of those things you know so uh, yeah I'm sure looking back on it now I wish I'd have paid a little more attention <laughs> but that's the way it goes right um was music something, you know, at a young age, you knew that w w was going to be something that you wanted to do? 
Yeah, that was, it's just, that's all I did. Um, as soon as I picked up the guitar in the ninth grade, I just never put it down and was always writing and listening and, you know, trying to find other people to play with. Growing up where you, you know, you, you grew up and you, you know, in those early bands and, 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 and things like that uh, and, and experimenting with music, did it feel that a career in music was, was something that was possible from where you was from you know was there was there bands that had come from where you were that had, had you know that that were, were inspirational uh f for you yeah there were a lot of really great cover bands where i grew up and so like a lot of good bar bands and uh you know there'd be a lot of people playing in church and you know playing a lot of spiritual music but uh but i think like i didn't know too many people playing original music in my hometown and so um but luckily i had uh this wonderful friend hillman who was a, a like incredibly creative person um who was super encouraging you know and um his dad as well would always really encourage us to just write our own stuff he's like y'all you can do it man it's good you know people people need this people not everybody needs cover bands you know so yeah. uh and so he really pushed us to to write our own stuff and and explore what we wanted to get out of the music um but it wasn't until I moved to Chapel Hill uh, when I was about 20 that I really started meeting people writing their own songs and, and doing this for a living. And it was, it shined a whole new light on, on what a career could be and um, the difference in making it big and actually having like a decent middle-class working music job, you know, yeah. uh, getting to play music and getting to travel. So Growing up was there, their records on indoors, uh, you know, at home. Sorry, uh, what was that last question? Sorry. Was there records on? You know, when you was when you were small like, at home, was there was, was it a musical family? A uh, very musical family. We uh, didn't listen to many records, but my mom played piano. Uh, her mom played piano, and my sister also is a piano player. So I grew up around just a a lot of people just playing music, you know. Yeah. Um, and I always wanted that. I just loved how I could sit there and watch my mom sit down at the piano and basically emerged like three hours later just having yeah. played all of these different songs and uh she was really good at, at being able to string together all of these pieces um so she'd be in the middle of playing one and be about to finish it and she would just think of another one and just go right into it you know and yeah. i love that i love the freedom that she had on the uh on the keys and and it just seemed like she was just swimming in her mind yeah. um and I always wanted that. And so I, I never took to the piano. I like, I can play some piano just because I grew up with it. I get it. But it, um, but it's not something that when I sit down to play that I really want to dive into, but when yeah. I, you know, so um, the guitar was like kind of the stepping stone on that path. But then when I came to the mandolin, it was like, I think, something about the timbre of that that instrument uh with the double strings i think kind of reminds me a little bit of the piano um and then also just how the the tuning of it is so it basically is the same as a fiddle yeah you can play all of these fiddle tunes and uh just really navigate melodies um pretty simply on the mandolin and that one it just became this this little puzzle to crack that i just yeah. like every time i pick it up i'd I find new things and uh, because it's such a small fretboard you can you can get across some pretty intricate ideas by spanning a few octaves yeah um you know pretty pretty easily i mean you can get some good stretches going on there but uh but yeah it's just a, a wonderfully creative instrument that i oh. that i've found like a an it, endless supply of creativity there so it, it's it's one of my favorite instruments and i i think when i was maybe 16 um i heard green by rem and mm -hmm. i'd never really heard a mandolin used in kind of popular guitar music i guess maybe, maybe I, I had and, and really sort of picked up on it massively but hearing some slower tracks on green and just thinking oh, holy shit this sounds beautiful and then obviously fast forward a year or so to out of time and then i think you know the mandolin and REM then become, you know, something that you you, you push together straight away. You, you the opening chords to Losing My Religion to the end of that track. And there's so many beautiful records on that 
that song. I think whether I think I heard that Peter Buck said that he, you know, he just got bored of the guitar for a bit and just picked <laughs> up a mandolin and yeah. uh, and just wrote two incredible records with it. And uh, yeah, it's an absolutely beautiful, beautiful instrument. Yeah, very versatile, and it. Uh, I think too, where it, because of the tuning of it and where it sits, you know, in that octave, it has a a really nice cut to it. That uh, yeah, I don't know. I, there's something there's something about where it sits in a mix, whether it's a you know a rock and roll band or a, a string band. Yeah, I think it adds a lot of a lot of power and a lot of weight to the whatever band it's in. So absolutely, absolutely. Um, last track in the formative years, Andrew, I'm going to ask you to tell me the first song you remember buying from a record store, please. Yeah, it was uh, Led Zeppelin 2. Um, I remember uh, when I first heard Ramble On, it was, I was like this, you know, it was another Strawberry Fields moment, you know. Uh, I think, um, it actually, that might have been before Strawberry Fields. I think I was probably like 14 or 15 when I went to go buy Led Zeppelin 2. Um, but uh, my my friend's dad is a good guitar player, um, and so he he showed me how to play Ramble On one day, and I was like, I've never heard this song, and he was like, What? You've never heard Ramble On by Led Zeppelin? You got to go check this out. <laughs> um, he's like, It's it's one of the coolest acoustic guitar pieces, you know, just because mm -hmm. uh, you can just move this E chord around. Um, and so yeah, I went and bought that album, and when I put Ramble On for the first time, I. I love the tone of that song, you know, like how those acoustic instruments are all just making this incredibly, uh, like just a really pulsing tune, you know, yeah. and I, I think acoustic instruments have a, a cool power in that sense where they can be really melodic, um, but they can also just be so drum-like and just move so much air when you hit them. Um, and I think all of that air just translates straight to just stirring some innate, part in all of us that just makes yeah. us want to dance to a drum you know um and so and i think that that song captures that beautifully where it's just this wonderfully melodic pulsing piece and then uh obviously robert plant's singing is just out of this world and yeah. and just makes the hair stand up on the back of your neck every time he hits a note so um yeah that was a proud day when i went to pick up that album wonderful yeah. I mean, yeah. in regards to record stores, were were they important places for you? Definitely. Yeah, because, I mean, you know, you'd walk in, you can talk to the people behind the desk and listen to what they're playing on the speakers. And um, I think especially in those years, um, I was just, just wanting as much music as possible, you know, and to yeah. hear as many songs as possible. And, and so yeah, you walk into a record store and there's just all of this possibility, you know, and, and it's really cool to think about how much depth is there. It's almost like a little black hole, you know, you could go Sorry. just get sucked into this record store and never come out and have an endless supply of music to listen to. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. It's, um, and, you know, to me, I think the older I get, the more I love just the whole concept of this really simple surface. And then, you fall just slightly below that surface and then you realize that it, there's just an endless depth there. Um, yeah. And some of my favorite records sound like that. And I think a record store definitely has that same thing where, you know, on the surface, it's just a bunch of cardboard and plastic, but then, you know, you start diving into each of those little pieces and there's a, a whole world there and a whole like perception shift, you know, from one, from the start of one record to the end of it you yeah. can be a completely different person at the end of that and look at life in a completely new light. So um, a lot of beauty there. I hope record stores always are around because they're wonderful. Uh, are you, are you someone that if you're, you're, you're touring, you know, and you, you, you get to a town, uh, if there's a record store, are you, are you going in? Yeah. Um, usually, you know, just because there's, I feel like record stores are very often, um, just kind of at the heart of a music scene, you know? And so it's a good way to meet people and it's a good way to kind of see what folks in the area are really into, um, you know? And so it's because this is what we do, not only for a living, but, you know, are very passionate about, I think it's a good way to kind of get a feel for the town that you're, you're visiting, you know, is to go see the local record store. Definitely. 
Well, I'm going to move things on uh, and um, I want to talk about clubbing. Um, and I, I, I mean, I, you, you, you've sent me your tracks over and there was a, a note with this one. And I've got to say of the 320 episodes of this, this podcast I've done, I'd say 300 people have echoed what you said. Really? Uh, <laughs> nice. Yeah. So you're not alone. You wasn't the only guy that weren't out there raving. And uh, yeah. uh, and, and and so yeah. So I'm going to ask you about the song that soundtrack your years clubbing. But I should I should add this when I send these questions out that this can be hanging out in a dive bar. This can be a local rock club. This hasn't got to be glow sticks shirt off. You know, oh, hands great. in the air <laughs> raving to EDM. This you know yeah. this, this can be whatever felt like your kind of, you know, the, the, those years where you found your tribe and you, you go out and party together. And so right. it's, it's more around that. Okay. Well then if that's the case, I might change my answer. Go um, for it. <laughs> um, no, I would say um, the record blood on the tracks was uh, where I finally started. If we're talking about like being in bars and actually finding yeah. our people. Um, I was always a, an early Dylan fan because I love um, I love the way Dylan plays guitar for one he's a great guitar player um, especially when it comes time to carry a song you know I feel like his playing always serves a song um, so when I told some friends of mine that I was starting to get to know here in town uh, in Chapel Hill where I live now um, that I was a Dylan fan they said well dude blood on the tracks right and I was like I've never listened to that record what are you talking about and so I can't believe how many moments you've had in your life where people are like, you've not heard Ramble On. Yeah, exactly. You've not heard this. <laughs> well, it's like those are maybe um maybe those are just really formative moments for me. So they stick out, you know. Absolutely. But, uh, um but it's it is that thing. It's like once you discover a, a new track or a new artist, you know, it it's life changing and mm. it it makes especially as a musician and a songwriter it completely changes the way I think about yeah. music. Um, so uh, definitely those moments stick out to me. Um, yeah. But so they just went to the jukebox and put on Blood on the Tracks because obviously it was there because everybody else knows this record and I don't. Um, but yeah, we just sat there and we just drank beers and we just didn't talk for the entire length of this record. Um, and so from there, obviously, I went to the local record store and I bought the album uh, and went home with it but there that uh i just remember that that moment so clearly because you know dylan on a lot of the records i've been listening to was more philosophical and like was yeah. kind of like exploring you know the natural world a little bit more and and on blood on the tracks he was pretty vicious you know yeah. just like just baring his teeth and uh it was refreshing to hear and it kind of it tapped into a different like a meaner side of me yeah. too that uh that i don't entertain too often so it felt good it was almost like a release you know to yeah. to hear someone's anger uh just laid out so beautifully on a record yeah. um it's so, so br yeah brilliant isn't it how how anger can come across and uh, through music and, and be a you know somewhere where you can personally kind of let off steam or or, or feel you know channel that and use it to propel you or whatever and 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 i find it really interesting that you kick-started this chat by talking about metallica you know which is a band <laughs> that I, I still play metallica records at my venue to to the next generation of 18 year olds that still you know lose their shit to that lose their shit to rage against the machine and Absolutely. and you know this is 30 years later but then you can have something as on the surface of it something far more gentle like Bob Dylan. Yeah. But he's equally, if not more, wise, angry, you know. Yeah. You know, the, 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 you know, there's vitriol on that album. Like, Absolutely. And, uh, and that, that fascinates me that it's not got to be... He heavy music comes in different forms. It hasn't necessarily got to have a distortion pedal, you know. True that. Yeah, and I, I think lyrics can be uh mm. just so so vicious you know and and can can really stir you um but you know i think i mean society definitely puts a cap on our anger you know and and won't really allow us to entertain that and so um 
but it's still there and like we have to get that out somehow and we have to feel those releases and it's a great mm-hmm. thing that there are bands like metallica and pantera out there that put out these wonderfully aggressive records that we can yeah. all just you know just sweat to and yeah like, and, and you know turn red in the face and get get that anger out but then also um it's almost like with blood on the tracks it's almost like a it it it's less of that feeling of wanting to punch something and and more of that feeling of of just that brooding kind of yeah. you know sitting back uh you know maybe i don't know drinking like a sinister drink you know with uh <laughs> <laughs> with like really nice ice cubes you know and you're just like just just kind of stirring it around looking at the world uh you know just and contemplating your move exactly yeah it's like a <laughs> It's like the pre-anger, you know. Uh, but, yeah, um, sitting there like Doctor Evil. <laughs> exactly, but it, yeah, anger, anger comes in so many forms, and uh, you know, I think it is, it is awesome that, that it can also be translated so wonderfully on a, on a gentle record, like you just said. That's yeah, that's awesome. Absolutely, I'm gonna take you home, and uh, for track six, uh, favorite song from an artist uh, from your home county, hometown, maybe. Yeah, um, I forget the song that I chose. It was a Phil Cook song. Juniper? Um, Juniper, yes. Which, I which I'd have. never heard until today. And, oh, It's a beautiful track, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. That's, uh, man, Phil Phil has such a like a great explorative spirit um, on whatever instrument he's playing. And, I'd, and I've never talked to him about that track specifically, but it sounds like he was just riffing. And that that melody just kind of poked its way out, and then he was like, "Oh, that's cool. Maybe I'll just play it a few more times." You know, yeah. um, and it has that sense of immediacy to it. Um, and I I don't know if it was written like right before he tracked it, or if he had been holding on to that one for a while. But something about the recording of that track to me, um, it just it feels like you're hearing that song being birthed right then um yeah. yeah and i love that track it, it's a great one for if i want to go for a run or just go for a little drive um or just waking up in the morning and having my first cup of coffee you know it's it's yeah. kind of it's kind of one of those uh, uh one size fits all tunes absolutely well for the last track um you you, you get to play tastemaker and turn someone onto something new you <laughs> can you can bestow now your your um your ramble on moment and uh, and offer it to someone else now and uh, and I'm going to ask you for a song that many people may not know that you would like them to hear. Yeah, it's a it's a song by Antonio Carlos Jobim, uh, and I don't know how to say it. it's like Bat Batidana or something. I, I don't know if I'm not familiar, but uh, with how to say it, but I can I can tell you that it is such a peaceful track that when you put it on. Um, that whole album wave is a, it's a great, a great album with all of these beautiful French horns, uh, you know, sections and some really beautiful string sections, some incredibly rhythmic and uh, expressive guitar parts. Um, But that track in particular, um, Batty Batty Dinah, I have to look up how to say it, um, is there's like whole sections where the horns are basically just droning and it's almost like he was playing with emptiness on the on the track and so when you feel that um you know those those spots where you you think that the french horns are going to come in with this like wonderful melody and then they don't (laughs) it's almost like uh it draws attention to the to the blank spaces in the song and um which I think nowadays is like you're saying, like probably wouldn't happen that often, you know, to where space is actually the, uh, is the goal is the achievement, you know? Um, but I think he, he does it beautifully on this track and, uh, throughout the whole record, but especially this one to where it, it almost, it almost suggests to your mind, you know, turn off for a second it's okay you're fine this is exactly where you're supposed to be right here right now listening to this music um and every time i put that album on um and it gets to that track that's how i feel is that you know everything is as you know as it should be and 
um, you know, life's not terrible. So, <laughs> well, we put together a Spotify playlist to accompany the podcast, so people can go and check out all of these songs um, oh, sweet. that we've spoken about today. Um, it would appear that the the second half of this year is going to be a lot more positive than the first half and and, and twenty twenty. Um, yeah. With that in mind, Andrew, what are you looking forward to most from from this year personally, and what's going to be happening professionally? Uh, just getting out and playing some shows, you know, finally uh, doing a lot of festivals this summer and um, not not gearing up for a big tour until 2022 when hopefully things are even more back to normal. Um, but even just in the past two months, you know, going out and seeing people I haven't seen in, you know, 16 months and being able to give them a hug and yeah. like not like not feeling weird about just being in someone else's presence. Um it just feels great. And I think, um, you know, I mean, if, you know, with everybody that we lost this year and with uh, just the way things went where every, everyone was so isolated, um, I know for me personally, it was a really good reminder that, you know, the reason I do what I do, um, you know, part of it is for self-expression, but another part of it is the community of it and the people that I've gotten to know here and and doing this. Um, and I don't think I would have pinpointed that um, in 2019. I don't think I would have told you that my whole reason for doing this is community, but um, I definitely see that now. And so now going out and, and seeing some of the people that I hadn't seen now for a while, um, that just it just serves as such a reminder to be like dude what's up this is exactly why i do this so we can hang out and we can play music together or we can talk about records or we can just go get a cup of coffee and like figure figure things out you know um so a lot of a lot of that in my future and really looking forward to that so wonderful wonderful yeah. it's been an absolute pleasure talking records with you today uh oh, man I Likewise. really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Right, I'll press stop.